Hi again, I'm Mark. It's been six years since I last did a video in English on the prophecies of Daniel, and I'm just so glad to be able to get started with these again. In recent years, I've been doing the videos in foreign languages, but I felt like it's time to get going with them again in English. To start with, maybe we can have a short review of the chapters we've seen already in Daniel before going forward with Daniel chapter 10. In chapter 2, we saw the young teenage Daniel. As a captive in Babylon, God miraculously brought Daniel before King Nebuchadnezzar to tell him his dream from God, which the king had forgotten, and its meaning. In Daniel chapter 7, we saw Daniel over 40 years later when he became a high official in the government in Babylon. In a vision in the night, Daniel saw four great beasts rise out of the sea, and then a vision of the Ancient of Days on his throne with the Son of Man. An angel explains to Daniel the significance of the four ancient empires to come, the coming of the Son of Man, and the Kingdom of God on earth. Then in chapter 8, only a few years later, Daniel was in a vision by a river when an angel appeared to show him a ram and a goat in battle, in which the goat defeated the ram. The angel explained this as being prophetic of the coming of Alexander the Great and the Greeks, who would defeat the Persians some 200 years ahead in the future. Also in this chapter, we learned more about the little horn, the Antichrist of the end time, that we first learned about in Daniel chapter 7. And it took two videos to cover Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was again visited by an angel after he had been in prayer for weeks. The angel delivered to Daniel one of the most significant, specific, and astounding prophecies in the Old Testament about the future of Daniel's people, about Jerusalem, and about the Messiah to come. But as important as these chapters are, there's still three more chapters that I'm not done till now. And in some ways, I'm going to change my target audience in doing the videos on Daniel chapters 10 through 12. In the first video I did in this series, nearly 15 years ago, I said this. I imagine some of you watching this know a lot about this subject and you're just itching to get into the details. And there's others of you who know virtually nothing about this whole thing. I'm aiming to reach both sides of that spectrum. But if I had to choose between the two, I'm going to aim this at those of you to whom this is mostly new. My intention back then was to keep things simple in order to reach as large an audience as possible. But I may need to now change that intended audience because in Daniel chapters 10 through 12, there are serious factors, even controversies, that need to be addressed. And in order to do the subject justice, I may need to delve into these things somewhat in order to bring the light of Scripture on them as much as I can. Daniel chapter 10 is only 21 verses. And basically, it's a narrative of what Daniel experienced in another encounter with an angel, or in this case, several of them. By this time, Daniel was up into his mid-80s. Daniel chapters 10 through 12 almost certainly cover one event, unlike the chapters we've studied before this, where you have a vision or experience that's started and ended in one chapter. So chapters 10 through 12 cover one event, but it's so monumental and long that it's been broken up into three chapters. Chapter 10 is just mainly the preparation for what's shown to Daniel in chapters 11 and 12. And there are several similarities with Daniel chapter 8, where this dear man of God had to be almost propped up by angels and sustained in virtually every way in order to be able to be the vessel God needed to receive the message from God back at that time. What is seen in Daniel chapters 10 through 12 is one of the most profound experiences any man of God has ever had with significance for us here in this world 2,600 years later. Places in this passage were pointed to specifically by Jesus Christ when He answered His disciples over 500 years later when they asked Him about His second coming and the end of this age. You may wonder what I'm talking about. So I'll bring in a verse that I've mentioned already in earlier videos. This is what Jesus said to His disciples in Matthew 24 when they asked Him what would be the sign of His coming and of the end of this age. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. I went over that verse in the video we did before this, when we studied the last verse in Daniel chapter 9, and how it relates to what Jesus said about the future in Matthew 24. And the single most clearly spoken verse in the book of Daniel that refers to the abomination of desolation is found in Daniel chapter 11, 
This has always been to me one of the greatest reasons to study these last chapters in Daniel in order to understand what it was that Jesus pointed his disciples toward and what had been shown to Daniel about these matters. So, amen. Lord bless his class. Daniel 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. There's a lot of important information right in that verse. In other words, the vision wasn't for that year or the next year, it was for the future. And another thing, Daniel understood it, because in Daniel chapter 8, he didn't understand it. He was troubled, and none understood it, as he said at the end of that chapter. But now, he's understanding it. Verses 2 and 3. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled." So he's at least in his mid-80s, and he'd been fasting and praying for three weeks. He's desperate in prayer to God, as he had been in several other chapters that we read about earlier. But the enemy of God didn't want this to happen. Satan did not want this message that was coming to Daniel to be delivered because it was so important. The spiritual battles and attacks on the book of Daniel itself are incredible if you read the history of it. And the devil was fighting it right here. We're going to read about that. Verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is, the Tigris. And if we remember, in chapter 8, Daniel was by another river that's near the Tigris, the banks of the Uli, Daniel said, which we today call the Euphrates. Jesus said, Go into your closet and shut your door and pray to your father in secret. Where did Jesus go to pray? The Garden of Gethsemane. That was his habit. He would go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Some of us have different places that we feel comfortable in when we pray. And Daniel, he prayed by the river. Verses 5 and 6. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude." Daniel wasn't really seeing a vision. What was he seeing? He was seeing an actual angel. In Hebrews 13:2, it says, "...do not be forgetful to entertain strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it." Sometimes angels can seem to just be a person, but when you start interacting with them, after about 10 or 20 seconds you start to go, Mm, this is sort of funny, because you can just tell this is not really a human being. But Daniel wasn't seeing an angel looking like a person. He was seeing an angel in his glory. And it seems like there's ranks, almost like there's sergeants and lieutenants, things like that. Maybe it's like what Jesus said, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father in heaven. Evidently, we each have our own angel or angels that are assigned to us, but also there seem to be higher ranks. I don't know totally how it all works, but this chapter is going to bring light on this. So Daniel is seeing this being whose voice is like many waters. Daniel 10:7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Well, that's interesting. The men who were with me. Daniel had been working as a top counselor in the government, so he had people with him. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus when he saw the light? There were people traveling with Paul who knew something was going on, but they didn't know what. So in this situation, the people who were with Daniel got real afraid and fled. And probably those people were pretty spiritual people themselves, probably his companions in the faith, I'm guessing, and they'd been right there with him at the riverside. Verse 8, Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. And you could say there, Daniel says it was a vision, but I don't think he had his eyes closed. It was a group experience. His friends took off. Again, it has some parallels to what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus and the reaction of Paul's friends who were there. 
You might wonder why Daniel was having any problem with what he was experiencing. But Daniel had been brought into a realm that's not normally permitted for humans, only angels. Over 500 years after this time, the angel Gabriel, speaking to the father of John the Baptist, said, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. But for us humans, it says of this place of glory that God, Jesus, and the angels now inhabit, that they are dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. And this is what was said of Moses when he met the Lord in his glory on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments in stone. And so frightening was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly feared and trembled. And this is similar to what was happening to Daniel in chapter 10. It may be hard for us to relate to it in any personal way. Verse 9, Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Maybe it's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 about, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Some of those things, after a while, it's like, are you awake? Are you asleep? Is it a vision? It evidently becomes difficult to really know what condition you're in. So Daniel was saying he was in a deep sleep upon his face. But if Daniel was in a deep sleep, then why did those guys run away? So my understanding of this is that this was not some kind of dream he was having. It was real. Maybe he went to sleep because he just couldn't take it and he passed out. Sometimes our own vocabulary is almost not sufficient to describe what we're experiencing. Verse 10, And suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. The angel touched him. Isn't that awesome? It's one thing to see an angel. It's another when the angel reaches out and touches you. The angels of God in the spiritual world needed Daniel because he'd been the vessel that God wanted to use. Daniel had been the channel for these things, and they needed to work with and through Daniel, and they strengthened him. Verses 10 and 11. And suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Man, greatly beloved. They don't have too many things like that in the Bible where it says something like that. It wasn't a common thing to be said. So God really loved Daniel. Daniel had been faithful in his generation. He didn't retire. He just kept hanging in there. He was faithful. So we'll read verse 11 again and go to 12. And he said to me, O Daniel, man, greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. It's virtually like Daniel was face to face with an alien, except it's a good alien, a mighty angel of God. Okay, we'll read verse 12 again and go to 13. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Okay, here comes the big verse. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So here's this angel perhaps it's Gabriel, talking to Daniel, and what did he tell him? To paraphrase that, we could say that the angel said he was delayed. And how did that happen? The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Sometimes it's like we live in darkness, but then the light of God's word brings light into the darkness, like lightning on a dark night, and the whole surrounding darkness lights up. This one verse here, lights up a whole lot. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. A prince of the demons 
withstood this angel to hinder this message of God from getting through to the prophet Daniel. This is one of the best chapters in the Bible on the subject of warfare in the spiritual world. Maybe we can look in the New Testament at what Paul said in Ephesians 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So if you're a person who marks your Bible, you could put the verse Ephesians 6.12 next to Daniel 10.13. And let's try one more where Michael the archangel is seen in spiritual warfare in the book of Jude, verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Why would Michael the archangel be contending with the devil about the body of Moses? I can't prove it from the Bible, but this is the thought I've heard on this. Back in those days, the Jewish people had just come out of Egypt. The Egyptians embalmed their pharaohs, then made big shrines to them and virtually worshipped them in the afterlife. And that wasn't what God wanted His followers to do. But the devil wanted to get control of Moses' body so that he'd be able to get those often wayward Jewish people of that time to do something like that. But it wasn't God's plan. That's the best explanation I've ever heard on something like that. But we have here another picture of the spiritual world. The Archangel Michael contending with the devil. And in this case, in Daniel chapter 10, that demon doesn't just have some crazy name or something. He's called the Prince of Persia. And we're going to read in a little bit, there's going to be the Prince of Greece. So we go, I wonder if there's a Prince of Russia or of China or of your country. Or mine. In the Bible it says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul said, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. We're not to spend all our time talking about the devil and the works of the devil, but we're not ignorant of his devices. We are informed. We know how things work. This is the world that we live in now. And it should help us to realize that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth, that we serve a coming ruler, and that this world right now is under alien power. We'll read verse 13 again and go to 14. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I've been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. And here's possibly one of those potential controversies I talked about at the first that could be seen here. We could take 45 minutes just to talk about who your people is there. Probably most of you watching now never even thought about this. But this subject here is controversial. And it's one I've realized I probably at least need to touch on in these classes on Daniel chapters 10 to 12. For me, I consider myself to be part of the your people that the angel refers to there. Because I'm a child of God by faith. We are children of God by faith. Most of us are not born Jewish, but we're born into the kingdom of God through salvation. So when it says there, your people, that includes us. It's a bigger subject than that, but that's as far as we'll go with it right here. Verse 15. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. He became speechless. It was just too much for him. He was barely hanging on. But it shows human frailties. It shows the humanness of Daniel, something we can all relate to. Verses 16 and 17. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, my Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Daniel was pushed to the limit, but he kept holding on. He kept in the right spirit, even though his body and his human nature were overwhelmed. Verse 18, Then again, 
the one having the likeness of a man, touched me and strengthened me. It's almost like Daniel is on some kind of angelic life support that they're trying to help him to keep himself together and be strong. Verses 18 and 19. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Daniel was just barely able to hold it together enough to get this communication from God. But this message that's about to be given to Daniel is what Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 when he said, Whoever reads, let him understand. What Jesus referred to there is coming up in Daniel chapter 11. It's important to take note of the incredible spiritual battle that's highlighted in this chapter. Daniel suffered for this and went to almost the ultimate length to get this for us. We have the significance shown to us from the three-week battle between the forces of God and Satan that went on, from the arduous encounter that Daniel had here, and from the specific words of Jesus about parts of this message around 600 years later. So this and the message coming up must be important. Verse 20, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. The Persians were in power at that time, but the power that was going to come was the Greeks. This is what happened with Alexander the Great. He defeated the Persians at Gaugamela in 332 B.C. But what's going on here is 200 years beforehand, and the angels of God are already foretelling it in advance. Verse 21, But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth, and no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So each of these verses is just loaded with significance. That's the end of chapter 10, but I'm going to read the first four verses of chapter 11. We're not going to study it in depth right now, but I want to show you how the text flows right into the next chapter. Daniel 11, verses 1 and 2a. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. It's the same thing. It's the same conversation. They just made a chapter break. In all the other chapters up to this, there's a clear end of the chapter at the last verse. But here, the text flows right into the next chapter. Daniel 11, 2b and 3. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Who's that mighty king spoken of there? Alexander the Great. We studied about this in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 11:4. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others besides these. This is just so amazing. This is exactly what we saw in Daniel chapter 7. A leopard with four heads symbolizing Greece. And in Daniel chapter 8, we saw the goat with four horns Again, symbolizing Greece. And in Daniel chapter 11, we see the same thing again. Three different chapters, three different pictures of the Greeks to come, and how Alexander the Great's empire would be broken up into four parts after his death. And that's where we're going to stop. In the next class, we're going to go over halfway into Daniel chapter 11. We're not going to see any beasts, any angels, or even any visions. Just a continuation of this dialogue that's been started in chapter 10. But the content is going to surpass all that we've studied till now. In some ways, Daniel chapter 11 is a little difficult. But we'll find that the dear Lord Jesus has been through this chapter before us. And we'll even find that He's placed something like a mountain hut. Something we'll find familiar far up into the mountains of prophecy in Daniel chapter 11. So, Prepare your heart. One of the most major chapters in all of Bible prophecy is what we'll study next. It's a thrill to look forward to it. 
God bless you. I love you.